Psalms chapter 10, verse 1. This is credited to David, even though it's not written in the, uh, in the heading of the Psalms in the Bible. But as I was researching some of the background, some, some think it's actually the second half of chapter 9, and that David is the author. But can you relate to verse 1 at all? Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And I want you to see here what I meant when I started this series on Psalms. Not that we're going to go through chapter by chapter, but just pick out highlights along the way. This is very therapeutic spiritually for all of us. Because every one of us here in this room have had times of doubt. We have had times of fear. We've had times when we've prayed and it seems like no one hears us, no one is listening. And if saints like David went through times like this, we certainly are going to go through times like this. Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? How many of you have prayed and you're still waiting for an answer, and day after day goes by, maybe even month after month, or year after year even goes by, and it seems like the answer never comes, and you start to think, and you're anguishing in your heart, God, what are you doing? You see the trouble that I'm in. Why don't you do something about this? Why didn't you stop this before it happened? He goes on in Psalms chapter 13, skipping ahead three chapters, and I want you to see this is kind of a recurring battle that David goes through, and it's going to be a recurring battle that you and I go through, and it doesn't mean that anything's wrong with you or your faith. It's the battle of being in this life, on this earth, trying to serve an invisible God. We are so dependent upon our five senses. And God wants us not to walk by sight. He wants us to walk by faith. And so he's going to lead you down some really deep and dark valleys so that you learn how to walk by faith. And you don't have to see with your eyes or feel with your hands, but you follow his Holy Spirit. In Psalms 13, he prays something very similar how long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How many of you have had some days like that where your heart was just so heavy and it didn't seem like you could even get through or think about the next minute? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? God, where are you? And why aren't you doing something about this? Psalms 88, verse 13. But I, O Lord, cry to you in the morning. My prayer comes before you. O Lord, why do you cast my soul away? I'm trying to come and share with you my heart, and it's like I just get pushed away. Why do you hide your face from me? I think as we've gone through different midnights of our life and different seasons through the valley of the shadow of death, we, we can relate all too well. And every one of us would have to raise our hands, I, mine the first, to confess we've doubted him. And we have been afraid. But then it can even go a step further. We all know the trial that Job went through, right? Job 13, verse 24 he says almost identical to what David later said, why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? I thought you were my God and my father and my shepherd and my deliverer, the one that was there for me. I thought there really was someone on the other end of my prayers. Where are you, God? And if we're not careful, verse 24 can turn into verse 3 where Job now becomes angry at God. Anybody ever been there? I have. I would speak to the Almighty, 
and I desire to argue my case with God. Really? <laughs> you remember that book decades ago? Uh, something like, Your Arms Are Too Short to Box with God? I don't think I ever read that book, but that title sure is stuck. Do you really want to argue your case with God? I'd almost pay money to see that. Job 23, verse 1 Job answered and said, Today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. I just, I'm just so depressed, I can't even lift up my hand. Oh, if I only knew where I might find him. Just remind yourself, if you're ever praying that prayer, I wish I could find God, just remember he is closer than your next breath. He is closer than your next heartbeat. That I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. God, you missed it. This isn't right. You should have done this on my behalf. I don't understand. You need to fix this. You ever had that attitude? I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me in verse 5, this is actually a cocky statement of, I just want to hear how God's going to explain this one. Because this isn't right. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me because I'm right. And this isn't right and this isn't fair. That's happening to me. And he should be doing something about this. And I know that if I, if I addressed him with my great wisdom and superior intellect, in intellect, that he would agree with me and say, Job, you know, I'm sorry, you're right. It's amazing, the haughtiness of man and the pride of man. We, we're looking through this life through a little peephole, and we really think we know what's going on, and we have no clue. There an upright man could argue with him, and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. Really? So then in Job 38, then the Lord answers Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Let me translate that for you. God is saying, Job, that's one of the most ignoramus things I've ever heard. Dress for action like a man, because I'm going to question you, and if you think you're so smart and wise, you're going to make it known to me. You're going to instruct me in what I, as God, should be doing. And then he starts these questions, and it would be, you would have great fun sometimes sitting down and reading Job 38 and 39, because it's one of these type of questions right after another. Where were you? when I laid the foundation of the earth. Were you there? My gosh, how did I do that without your help? Without you there telling me what to do? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Come on, Job, tell me. Who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? And who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band, and I prescribed limits for it and set bars and doors and said, Thus far you shall come and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. Job, have you commanded the morning since your days began? In other words, do you tell when the sun to rise? Have you caused the dawn to know its place, that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked their light is withheld and their uplifted arm is broken. 
Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all of this. I'm listening, Job. Explain these things to me. And then he goes on, and I just gave us a taste of this. It's fun to read through Job 38 and 39, but then in Job 40, the Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Job, after God's questioning, is beginning to get the hint. The picture is becoming clear because he answers the Lord and he says, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? How can a man dare stand and accuse God and question his goodness and his wisdom and his knowledge? And many times we complain, God, where are you? Why aren't you doing something about this? And we're peering through this little peephole of life that we have. And if only we could see the big picture as God sees it, we would see the wonderful wisdom and grandeur of his plan, his majesty, his sovereignty. We would see that he does all things not just well, but he does all things perfectly that there is nothing that we have to add or take from his plan. And we would say, God, thank you for letting me be a part. Instead of complaining about what comes into our life. He says, I lay my hand on my mouth. And he realizes, I've gone way too far, God. I have spoken once and will not answer twice but I will proceed no further. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. You be my guide. You be my counsel. You instruct me, Job. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you even dare say that God made a mistake or that something slipped through God's fingers? Will you condemn me that you may be in the right? Have you an arm like God and can you thunder with a voice like his? And then coming to the conclusion of the story, Job 42, then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? He's beginning to confess, Lord, I'm an idiot. I'm a sinner. I'm a rebel for the things that I said. I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Because I don't instruct you, God. I know that you are the one who instructs me. So I'm going to put my hand over my mouth and stop pretending Like I have the answers, I'm going to ask you for all of the answers. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and in ashes. And he realizes in humility who he is and who God is. And he's beginning to get a clear picture now of the majesty and the wonder of God. And so, here in Psalms chapter 11, and I'm running out of time already, but maybe we can skip through the verse 3 verses and just target in on verse 4 here. The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, His eyelids test the children of man. And look at verse 5. The Lord tests the righteous. One big issue that comes with trials, 
Are you willing to be tested by God? Are you willing for God to put painful things in your life to test your reaction, to test your surrender? Can you say, Lord, I am a living sacrifice. Do with me, do to me whatever you will, whatever you deem right and fit. The Lord tests the righteous. And a lot of times, one of the hardest parts of humility in our life is submitting to his plan. I'm sure Joseph questioned God many times. I'm sure sitting in that prison, there were times Joseph became angry at God and said, God, what are you doing? I don't understand this. But the Lord will test the righteous. And I want to show you why here. Remember in Genesis 22, verse 1, Abraham had his promised child, Isaac. He's now over 100 years old. Sarah gave birth when he was 100 years old. He says here in verse 1, after these things, God tested Abraham. Abraham's at the end of his life. I mean, he's been through the whole thing of, of believing God by faith for this miracle child. I mean, isn't enough enough? God, can't you give this old man a break and a rest? But remember what he said here, God tests the righteous. And he has that right because he has purchased you with the blood of Jesus and you are no longer your own. And so legally, you have no say in your life anymore. And as a living sacrifice, you've surrendered all rights. Remember that? And so he tested Abraham, and he said, Abraham, and Abraham said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering, and he arose and he went to the place of which God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. What torment do you think Abraham went through those three days? I mean, couldn't have God chosen a closer place? On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, and he laid it on Isaac his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. Look at this next sentence. So they went both. Abraham and his son Isaac, they went both of them together. I wonder how many times Abraham had to hide his eyes so that Isaac wouldn't see the tears. I wonder how many times maybe Abraham put his arm around Isaac's shoulder to realize in just another hour or two that shoulder was going to be dead and lifeless and cold. I mean, what, what could possibly be going through Abraham's mind right now? Yet he never wavered, he never hesitated, and he never doubted. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am, my son. And he said, Isaac said, the, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb. And then look at this, a second time it says, so they went, both of them, together. What agony must have been going through Abraham's heart, but he never wavered. What's going on here? In this proving of God, when we go through those times where we say, God, where are you? I don't understand what's going on. There are many purposes to the trials of God, but in these times that just inflict the heart the deepest, God is taking you to the very end of yourself. 
He's taking you to the very end of yourself to where there's no hope, there's no trust in you. It's all in God's hands now. And if God doesn't do anything, then nothing will be done. I've given up on me. I've given up on my ability. I've given up on my strength. I've given up on my supposed wisdom. I'm not going to strive anymore. I'm going to rest in God, put my trust in you, and I've come to the end of myself. And just think about that. God brought Abraham to the end of himself. God couldn't give them a baby when Abraham was 80 or 90 because possibly there might have been some natural chance that Abraham's seed was still strong enough to produce a baby. He had to take Abraham to the very, very end where it was impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have a child on their own. He had to take them to where all hope was lost. And this is exactly what Romans chapter 4 says. It says Abraham in chapter 4 verse 18, in hope he believed against hope. The hope that Abraham believed in was the hope of God. God can do this because God does miracles and there's nothing impossible with him. In hope, he believed against hope. He was believing against human hope. It was against hope in himself, hope in Sarah, because all that hope had long died. It it was too late for them to bear a child by themselves. See, God will take you to the very end of all natural hope, all natural trust or reliance upon yourself. Do you remember in the story of Joseph where he's, he's been in prison, he's been in jail for a number of years, and so he asks the butler, the butler's going to be released, so he asks the butler, hey, you know, speak of me to Pharaoh, please, and remind him that I'm here and I would really like to be set free, what does the butler do? He forgets about him. How much longer was uh, Joseph in jail? Two more years. You know what that says? That says that at that time, Joseph had two more years of natural hope left, and God had to wait for all that natural hope to die. You want to know why? Why? Because God doesn't share his glory with anyone. God does not share his glory with anyone. And he wants to bring us to the very end of ourselves where there's no more natural hope in us so that we can see the glory of God. When you are the weakest, when you are the nearest death, when you have nothing to bring to the table, nothing to give, nothing to offer, That's when his power manifests in its great glory. And you know why Abraham could give up Isaac, his son, without any hesitation? Because he knew beyond the shadow of any doubt that Isaac did not belong to him. Isaac was a gift from God because there was no way he and Sarah could have produced that. See, when we produce something, we want to hang on to it, right? We become very possessive and defensive and territorial. But Abraham knew in his heart, yes, Isaac may have come for, from our loins, but that was God that gave birth, not us. Nothing of our own natural strength or ability. And so if you're in a place tonight where you are coming to the end of yourself, if you are in a place tonight where you no longer trust yourself, if you're in a place tonight where you don't have the strength to carry on for one more day, you're in the best place of your life you could ever be. And God has brought you to that place. Just like he brought Abraham, and just like he brought Joseph, to where it's God and all God. And no man can take the credit for it. 
He wants to bring us to this place. Psalm 16, verse 2, I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Do you really believe that tonight? If you really believe that, then you would stop trying to interfere with God's work and fix you and fix everybody else and fix everything. I'm not saying, understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you do nothing. I'm just saying you do so in step with God under his leadership, under his instruction. You don't initiate it yourself. You wait upon God to initiate it in you. But if we really believed there is nothing good in me apart from God. See, that's why in heaven, the saints will cast their crowns before the throne. Why? Because they know, they know there's no credit to themselves. They know that was all God. Just like Abraham knew Isaac was all God and he couldn't take any credit. And so when God called Isaac back, Abraham couldn't hang on. Because it was nothing that Abraham produced in the first place. It was all God. And when you're in heaven and you're casting your crowns before the throne, it's because all the praise goes to him. I didn't do anything to earn this. Romans 7, 18, for I know that Nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right, but I don't have the ability to do what's right. John 15, 5, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's got to become the cry and the conviction of our heart. I put in there, last in your notes, you know the story of the criminal that died next to Jesus? This man had done nothing righteous in his life. He didn't have one thing, not even one thing, to say, for this I deserve heaven. And yet Jesus so wonderfully comforts him and reassures him that he will be with him in paradise that same day. And it really comes down to this. If you have even one reason why you should be in heaven, if you have even one explanation in and of yourself why you should be in heaven, you're not fit for heaven. We have to come like this thief. We have to come as a little child. We have to come as the true servants and saints and children of God, and say, Father, I bring nothing to the table. The only good about me is you. And if there's anything good that comes from my life, I certainly can't take the credit for it. And so therefore, Father, I'm, I'm not going to question you. I'm not going to become angry at you. I know my place in this relationship. And so I just surrender myself to you as a living sacrifice. You do with me, to me, through me, what you seem fit. Because I know your plan is perfect. And your plan is right. And Father, we do come to you tonight with that hard attitude. And we say, Lord... Please save us from ourselves. Please save us from the ignorance of thinking that we know what's best for us, of thinking that we understand and can tell God a few things like Job thought. Father, please bring us to the very end of ourselves so that like Abraham, we know that nothing we possess is our own. It all belongs to God. It all came from God. And so therefore, I hold all earthly things loosely. And my heart is surrendered to you, Father. Father, we thank you. And we worship you. 
As we go, we pray now that you would conduct us home safely. Father, give us the reassurance of your love and your forgiveness. Let us sense the power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives tomorrow. Teach us how to not trust in our own wisdom or in our own strength, but to commit our lives to you fully. And to be loyal, obedient servants that receive your commands and receive your will with gladness. Because you do do all things right. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.